Hello, my name is Robert Moyeda, and I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Miami, serving all of South Florida. This presentation is a look back at Hurricane Andrew, especially as we approach the 20-year anniversary on August 24th. We will be presenting some data and statistics about Andrew and applying them to what we know today, 20 years after Andrew hit Miami-Dade County. Andrew developed from a tropical wave that moved off the coast of Africa in the middle of August of 1992 and on August 17th reached tropical storm strength over the central tropical Atlantic Ocean. For the next several days thereafter, Andrew moved to the west-northwest and remained rather weak. Uh, it was still a tropical storm as late as August 21st when it was to the uh, north of Puerto Rico and the Lesser Antilles. However, at that time, Andrew intensified rapidly as conditions in the upper levels of the atmosphere uh, became much more favorable and conducive for strengthening. Andrew reached hurricane strength on August 22nd, and only a day later, as it approached the Bahamas, reached the threshold of Category 5 intensity. Uh, that strengthening uh, trend continued as it approached South Florida and became a, or was a Category 5 hurricane at landfall. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next several slides. Uh, what's often forgotten here in South Florida is that uh, Andrew didn't just affect South Florida. As it, uh, once it passed through South Florida on August 24th and moved into the Gulf, remained a major hurricane over the Gulf, of Mexico and hit Louisiana a couple days later as a Category 3 hurricane. One of the things about Andrew was, of course, the intensity, how strong it was at landfall over South Florida. Just to illustrate how rare uh, a Category 5 landfall is, we've only had three on record to hit the United States. In other words, three Category 5s at landfall in the United States uh, since we've been keeping records, and those records go back to the 19th century. Uh, at, at the time, Andrew was the costliest hurricane in U.S. history. Uh, that was since surpassed by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. If we uh, adjust the damage uh, amounts to $2,010, Andrew caused approximately $45 billion in damage. Unfortunately, that resulted in 65 total deaths, that's direct and indirect, uh, with 40 of those in Miami-Dade County alone. Considering the strength and intensity of the storm, uh, even though 40 is a very high number, it could have been a lot worse. The maximum sustained winds of Hurricane Andrew at landfall in South Florida was estimated at 165 miles an hour, putting it at the Category 5 range. These winds were estimated because virtually all the instruments over land failed uh, when the strongest winds of Hurricane Andrew reached the coast. Therefore, the winds, uh, the, the observations that were used to determine that wind speed were largely from aircraft, which were flying uh, as the storm made landfall, and also some of the uh, recorded wind gusts, which you, which you can see here on the slide, uh, that were observed over land before the instruments failed. We mentioned earlier that Hurricane Andrew intensified rapidly uh, before reaching South Florida, and in fact, as you see in the last uh, bullet there of the slide, in the last eight hours before landfall. The uh, hurricane increased in intensity by 20 knots. That's a full category. Those kind of winds, unfortunately, led to severe to catastrophic impacts in Miami-Dade County. Approximately 49,000 homes were left uninhabitable, with an additional 108,000 suffering uh, significant to severe damage. That led to 180,000 people, actually more than 180,000 people left homeless uh, because of, they just couldn't stay in their homes, and in many cases for several weeks or even months. The mobile home community in South Miami-Dade County uh, suffered greatly 
from the impacts of Andrew. 90% of mobile homes in the southern portion of Miami-Dade County were destroyed, and in the city of Homestead, virtually all of them were destroyed. Uh, one of the uh, major impacts to the South Miami-Dade community was the impact to the Homestead Air Force Base, which was severely damaged and unfortunately never completely recovered, and that uh, definitely was a huge economic impact on the Homestead community, which took uh, several to many years to recover from. An understated impact from Hurricane Andrew was the storm surge it produced along the Biscayne Bay coastline of Miami-Dade County. The maximum storm surge was 16.9 feet at the former Burger King headquarters off of Old Cutler Road and Southwest 184th Street. The picture on the lower left of the slide is a picture from the CEO's office showing damage from the water, or the storm surge, as well as wind damage. At the nearby Deering Estate, the storm surge was 16.5 feet, and that's reflected in the picture at the top right, with that water penetrating inland quite a ways. In fact, as far north as the northern part of Biscayne Bay, in other words, near downtown Miami, the storm surge was estimated about 4 to 6 feet. So we can't ignore the impact from the surge. Fortunately, because that the Biscayne Bay coastline south of downtown Miami is relatively unpopulated right at the coast, uh, the impacts uh, were mitigated somewhat. If that same storm surge would have been farther north, let's say, we, uh, for example, a eight or nine foot surge right on Miami Beach and areas to the north, the impact of the surge would have been much greater. This is the last radar image captured by the National Weather Service Miami Network Radar, the WSR-57, recorded at 4.35 a.m. on August 24th. Uh, the, the eye there clearly seen right over Elliott Key, and the red ring around the eye is the eye wall, and that's likely where the strongest winds were located, especially on the northern and northwest side of that eye wall. That was the last radar image captured by the Miami radar due to the fact that shortly after that time the radar antenna blew down. In fact, this picture here shows the damage to the radar on top of the 12-story building in Coral Gables. Uh, this was due to the winds of, uh, that were recorded over 160 miles an hour near the time of the collapse of the radar. The initial classification of Hurricane Andrew was as a Category 4 at landfall with maximum sustained winds of 145 miles an hour. Ten years later, the National Hurricane Center, in conjunction with NOAA's Hurricane Research Division, upgraded Andrew to a Category 5, with maximum sustained winds of 165 miles an hour. The basis for the upgrade wasn't due to new data that we didn't have before, but in fact it was the same data or a reanalysis of the same data recorded during the storm, but with a better understanding of how the wind speeds change with height as you go from the level at which the winds are taken by the hurricane reconnaissance aircraft down to the surface. And based on that better understanding, the analysis for the reanalysis team was able to make upward adjustments to those winds. It's important to note that the Category 5 uh, assigned intensity was really uh, only for a very small part of the coast. In other words, those maximum sustained winds of 165 miles an hour likely occurred over a very small area right at the coast. Therefore, most uh, folks in central and south Miami-Dade County experienced Category 3 or 4 conditions, still very strong winds and the damage that resulted, uh, the damage that was observed in central and south Miami-Dade County illustrates the fact that Category 3 and Category 4 winds are still very strong winds capable of producing severe and even catastrophic damage. These images illustrate the original wind analysis 
done by NOAA's Hurricane Research Division, and it shows the extent of the wind field over South Florida. One of the features of note is the small size of the eye of Hurricane Andrew. The eye of Andrew was only about 10 miles wide when it made landfall, and the radius of the maximum sustained wind north of the eye was only about 12 miles away from the center. Once you got beyond 25 or 30 miles north of the eye, the wind speeds came down rather quickly. Most of Broward County observed only marginal hurricane force winds, with Palm Beach County only recording tropical storm force winds. To the south of the eye, a similar pattern was noted. Once you got down to the upper keys, only marginal hurricane force winds were recorded, and once you got down to the middle keys, only tropical storm force winds. This is the modified analysis done back in 2002 by the Hurricane Research Division. As mentioned previously, the wind measurements over land were incomplete due to most or all of those instruments failing as the maximum or the strongest winds of the storm reached land. The Hurricane Hunter aircraft that fly into the storms to record the meteorological data, they fly at about 10,000 feet. And that was the case as Hurricane Andrew was approaching the coastline. The typical wind reduction from the flight level of 10,000 feet down to the surface is about 90%, and this was based on research that was done after Hurricane Andrew, and this led to the upgrade in the hurricane to a Category 5 and the increase in the maximum winds from 145 to 165 miles an hour. In other words, the adjustment in the wind reduction ratio was the main factor resulting in the upgrade of Hurricane Andrew. A common observation by many who went through the worst part of Andrew was that the damage in their area was caused by tornadoes. In fact, no tornadoes were reported as Hurricane Andrew made landfall across South Florida. This doesn't mean that tornadoes didn't occur, just that, just that they were not reported. Post-storm damage done by Dr. Ted Fujita did indicate narrow swaths of heavier damage related to nearby areas, and this is the same type of damage that is commonly observed in tornadoes. However, Dr. Fujita concluded that these uh, areas of heavier damage were likely caused not by tornadoes, but by phenomena called mini-swirls. Mini-swirls are essentially natural perturbations in the winds circulating around the eye wall, and these perturbations, or eddies, if you will, are stretched upwards by the updrafts inside of the stronger storms contained within the eye wall. So they can resemble damage caused by tornadoes and in some cases are associated with swirling winds over a very small area. As it turns out, many swirls are common in many hurricanes of the similar intensity as Hurricane Andrew. We'll never truly know the magnitude of the strongest winds associated with Hurricane Andrew over South Florida. In fact, not all meteorologists agreed with the upgrade in 2002 from a Cat 4 to a Cat 5. And this slide, you can read this, a statement made by Dr. Mark Powell of the Hurricane Research Division disagreeing with the upgrade. We'll conclude this presentation with a couple of comments regarding a lessons learned, what we've learned from the experience of Hurricane Andrew and how we can apply it to how we prepare for storms today. First of all, South Florida is the most hurricane-prone part of the country. Going back to at least the year 1900, more hurricanes have directly impacted South Florida than any other part of the country. Not only that, South Florida has been hit more often by Category 3, 4, and 5 hurricanes than any other part of the country. So we're also more prone to major hurricanes capable of producing damage similar to what occurred with Hurricane Andrew. 
Therefore, we must always be in a state of readiness, especially during hurricane season, and we need to make sure that our homes and our properties are properly protected from potentially catastrophic, very high or very strong winds. Also, we learned from Hurricane Andrew that hurricanes can strike any year, even years of relatively little activity basin-wide. 1992 only had seven storms that reached tropical storm strength, which is well below the long-term average of 12. This concludes the Hurricane Andrew presentation. For updated weather information, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, including warnings and forecasts, visit our website at weather.gov forward slash South Florida.